Hey guys, Heidi Breeb here. Um, I'm in my new apartment, so that's very exciting. It's not super set up yet. I also am not a lifestyle vlogger, so I'm probably never gonna show you any more than this corner, but um, this is my filming corner, very exciting. Got a fake fireplace and some books in the background, and that's gonna be my set for a while. Um, today, I wanted to talk about something that I was thinking about a lot after a video that I released a few months ago, which was called, I think, Top 10 Mistakes That ENFPs Make in Relationships. And I was getting all these comments by like people who'd been jaded by ENFPs or ENFPs who are really down on themselves for making all of these mistakes. And I was thinking about how I wasn't necessarily sharing the entire picture because I think the reason why ENFPs make a lot of mistakes in relationships is because growing up, a lot of us don't really have a model for what someone like us needs in a relationship. So we're taught all of these things that don't necessarily apply to who we actually are. And then we just go and try to replicate them and then it doesn't work. And then we put it on ourselves for having failed or having um, let somebody down and a lot of the time it's really just that we don't know what our needs are in relationships, so we don't know what to look for. And I want to address that in this video. So I want to talk a little bit about what you need to be looking for as an ENFP going into romantic relationships, because your needs are going to look different than the needs of the average person. I remember when I started dating and growing up, the dominant kind of paradigm about relationships was like, oh, you should be with someone who challenges you. And that was kind of like the cool, sexy thing to want, because it was like this feminist ideal is like having a partnership where you feel challenged and excited and like a little bit competitive maybe in some ways. Um, and I ended up dating people who were just so unlike me and had drastically different interests, priorities, values than me. And I remember always being like, okay, I'm challenged. I feel very challenged. So like I must be doing this right, but it feels terrible and I'm not enjoying my relationships. I don't really feel like myself in them. I don't feel inspired or alive. Um, and I eventually had to realize that being challenged is a very subjective term that can mean a lot of different things. And there are ways I like to be challenged and ways I don't like to be challenged at all. Ways I just like to totally chill out and relax with my partner. And that is so fine. Being an NP type means the world is already kind of challenging. And we also tend to challenge ourselves in a lot of ways. So you don't necessarily need a partner who's going to push you to develop and grow in all of these ways that you might not necessarily want to grow in. And that's a really, really important thing right off the bat that I think we need to make clear. Another thing I want to address before we get going is that there is no ideal type pairing in MBTI. Everyone wants there to be like this ideal type who you meet and you're just going to click with and everything's going to go swimmingly. And I really, really don't ascribe to that notion that that's a thing. There are definitely types who you might be more predisposed to having a connection with. So it might be a little bit easier for you because you already have some kind of mental processes in common to find common ground, but that doesn't mean that's gonna be the best person for your development. It doesn't mean that's gonna be someone who you have shared interests with. It doesn't mean it's gonna be someone who shares your lifestyle preferences. And I think a lot of those things are a lot more important than pure baseline cognitive compatibility. So I just wanna encourage you to keep a really open mind as you think about what you want in a relationship and don't look at MBTI as a predictor of what you want. Look at MBTI as something that can help you make a relationship work with whoever you do end up with because you like them. So now that we've talked about all that, let's talk about some of the things that you might want to look for in a relationship as an ENFP to make sure that you're able to fully and completely be yourself in the relationship and bring all of the awesome and unique gifts that you have into your relationship. So green flag number one for ENFPs in relationships is someone who is flexible and open-minded. So leading with dominant extroverted intuition means that your life is never gonna be perfectly consistent. Maybe for certain stretches of time, you wanna kind of hunker down and do one thing, but for the most part, over the course of your life, you're gonna have a million different interests, a million different careers you wanna pursue and places you wanna to travel to and things that you're really interested in. And while there's something to be said for sure in a partner that grounds you, you don't want a partner who grounds you at the expense of you being able to fully and freely explore the world, which is what your mind is born to do. So I think I've talked a little bit about this before, but there are these six core human needs that I think it was Tony Robbins who coined them. He either made them up or he just talks about them a lot. Oh, I got these from Tony Robbins, but these six core human needs that we all have to varying degrees. And the needs are certainty, uncertainty slash variety, significance, connection and love, growth, and contribution. And I think that ENFPs in particular 
have a slightly lower than average need for certainty and a slightly higher than average need for uncertainty and for growth. And what that means is that over the course of our lives, we're gonna have a lot of shifting interests and we really need a partner who can support us through that and who isn't stressed out by that because someone who let's say has a really, really high need for certainty might actually feel really threatened by a partner who's pursuing a lot of uncertainty or a lot of growth. And while that may feel comforting during the periods where we're kind of looking to stabilize, it's not gonna work in the long term. If you're looking for a long-term partnership, and it's fine if you're not, you're gonna need a partner who's open to a lot of change and a lot of different ways of living and a lot of different things that you kind of try on and then throw out and who doesn't feel threatened or stressed out by that. When I was younger, I used to think that the best I could hope for was a partner who tolerated my many different shifting interests and passions and thoughts. And it wasn't until the last couple of years of my life when I realized, oh, you can have a partner who actually encourages you and really, really supports you pursuing all of these different areas. And it can feel really, really exciting to explore those things with a partner. And I really encourage you, if you are an ENFP and you're looking for a relationship and you've never felt that way, trust that that's out there, pursue that, make sure whoever you're dating is really open to you pursuing all the different avenues of life because that is what you're built to do. That's what you're here to do. And you do not want to limit yourself by being in a relationship that asks you to tone that down. Thing number two ENFPs really need in relationships, high quality conversation. So this is actually probably my personal number one. Like the number one question I always ask myself when I'm considering dating someone or getting into a relationship is, could I die talking to this person? Like, do I see myself waking up in 50 or 60 years and looking over at this person and being like, wow, we still have so much to say to each other. We still have so much to explore. And it is not about how much or what that person knows. It's not about where their area of expertise is. It's about their sense of wonder intellectually. So when I'm looking for someone who I connect with on that level, I'm not looking for the person in the room with the most information in their brain. I'm looking for the most curious person in the room, the person who is constantly fascinated by everyday things, who is constantly looking to learn and grow and expand their own skill set and their own knowledge base. Someone who's able to flip over a whole bunch of different intellectual rocks with me and just look at what's underneath and be curious and excited about learning and growing together. The ability to be really mindful about the life that they're living and the ability to observe their life in a way that is complex and nuanced and in depth is absolutely without question the single most important thing to me and I think probably to a lot of ENFPs. So NE likes to go wide and then FI likes to go deep. And if you can find a conversation partner who can do both of those things with you, and that doesn't have to mean that they're using the same functions. It could be actually very fascinating to find someone who uses completely different functions than you, but who can go to those places with you and provide new perspectives. That's a really, really good sign that your relationship is probably a lot higher on the natural compatibility scale than a lot of other relationships might be. Thing number three that I think ENFPs really, really need in relationship is the ability to be fun and lighthearted and silly with their partner. So ENFPs are kind of known for being um, very kind of like goofy and funny and out there, but I think internally we have this very serious side. So that's why we need those quality conversations. We need that ability to go out and explore new things and new topics, but we don't want things to be serious all the time. And I think a lot of ENFPs are really guilty for really liking intensity in people. Like we're drawn to very um, either emotionally or intellectually intense people. And then what happens is a lot of us get in these relationships where we're very intellectually engaged, but the kind of fun and excitement slowly drains out of our lives. I've had that happen to me. I've seen it happen to other ENFPs. And I think it's really important to note that you need someone you can laugh with who doesn't take themselves or life 100% seriously and who knows how to cheer you up when you're having a rough time. Because again, ENFPs tend to lead with their extroverted, fun, bubbly side, but we have very deep and very intense emotions and we can get stuck in those ruts and we can get stuck in those negative thought loops. And if you have a partner who's able to help you see the lighthearted side of things when you're in that place, that's something we really need when we're feeling dark or heavy or existentially distressed is a reminder that you can still find joy in life and you can find humor in everyday scenarios and that we don't have to take everything so, 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 so seriously. And I think that a lot of us are very used to being that person for other people, but it's really refreshing when we find a person who can also do that for us and who shares our sense of humor and who can bring that side of us out of us when we're not naturally in touch with it. So that's something that I think a lot of us don't naturally seek out, but that we really should consider when we're choosing a partner because life is very long. And if you're with someone who you can't laugh with through life, it gets really, really hard, but it doesn't have to be.
Thing number four I would encourage every ENFP to look for in a relationship is mutual autonomy. So I had this as two separate points originally. Like I was like a partner who's autonomous and then a partner who is comfortable with us being autonomous. And then I realized that's just kind of two sides of the same coin. So. ENFPs are very, very independent. We're very social people. We are very passionate people. We like to go out and pursue a lot of different things and pursue a lot of change and new experiences. And we need a partner who is comfortable with that. This is very similar to point number one, but we also need a partner who has their own sense of autonomy because a lot of ENFPs are not naturally great at setting boundaries. And that's absolutely something that we need to work on. That's a skill that we owe it to ourselves and to other people to develop consciously and purposefully. But it really helps us out if we find a partner who already has a natural sense of boundaries and who already has a lot of their own interests, a lot of their own things that they're pursuing, a lot of their own ideas and plans, because we don't want to find ourselves taking on too much of another person's stuff. We are very good cheerleaders and we're very good at motivating people and we're very good at seeing the best in people and encouraging people to develop towards their best and most authentic self, but we don't want to have to do that. We want to be in a supporting role for someone who already has a lot of their own stuff going on. And I think it's very common for a lot of younger ENFPs, and I very much fell into this trap when I was in my early 20s, to find someone who we see as kind of a project and be like, okay, I see this person's potential and I could push them towards it, but that's not sustainable long-term. If someone doesn't have their own natural sense of motivation and autonomy, it's gonna be really, really hard for us to serve as that person's fuel. They need their own sense of self, which actually leads me to my next point, which is point number five, we need to look for someone who has a very strong sense of self and who will not let us put them on a pedestal. And again, this is something where we really need to work on it. So ENFPs have this tendency to idealize people, to put them on pedestals, and then to be disappointed when the person doesn't match up to that pedestal in reality. And that is 100% on you as an ENFP if this is a trait that you have. Most of us go through it, especially when we're younger, once again. We actually talk a lot about this in the ENFP Soul Bootcamp program that I run. There's an entire module that's just dedicated to helping you figure out how to take people off pedestals and actually engage with them as a entire and complex human being who is standing in front of you with their own interests and thoughts and biases and past traumas and experiences that are different than yours. And it sounds funny, but it's a very real problem that a lot of ENFPs have is really favoring the idealized version of someone that they have in their head over the person that's actually standing in front of them in the flesh and blood. But because there are certain people who I think like to be told a little bit more what to do and how to act and how to behave, um, who don't have as strong or as developed a sense of self, there can be this really disastrous trap that happens if an ENFP links up with a person like that and the ENFP will try to kind of mold this person in, into who they're fantasizing them to be. And you really need to be with the person who will not go along with that, who understands their own boundaries very clearly and who can tell you, no, this is not me. I can't do this for you. I can't be this person for you, but here's who I am. And if you wanna love that person, that's great. And of course, there are always reasonable compromises, but you should never be asking someone to compromise their sense of self and their personal identity to fit a mold that you want them to fit into because that's really not gonna be healthy for you or for them long-term. Number six is one I debated on a little bit, but I really do think it applies. Someone who doesn't want to prioritize the material over the experiential part of life. And where this really comes into play, I think, is when you enter into a long-term relationship, you wanna start a family with someone, and you become very financially interdependent, and a lot of the decisions about where to live and how you wanna spend your excess money, if you wanna go on vacation, or if you wanna reinvest in education, or whatever it is. When you look at how you spend your resources in alignment with another person, you have to make sure you're fairly aligned in terms of what's important to you and what your core values are. And where I see NFPs get into trouble is when they find a partner who they might find grounds them quite a bit, maybe because they're a lot more practical than they are, but then there becomes this giant mismatch with how they want to spend their resources. So as an ENFP, we're always gonna naturally value the experiential and the um, opportunities to learn and grow and expand our horizons over kind of creature comforts. And that's just a virtue of our personality type. We are intuitive dominant types and sensing is our dead last function. And I think it can be very challenging for ENFPs who end up with people who really value the material over the experiential. So who 
really want to get the bigger house instead of take that trip every year, who really want to send their kids to the most expensive school instead of pushing their kids to pursue alternate routes of education. And it's not that those things can't be worked out and it's not that compromises can't be made, but I think that when you're working with a fundamental difference in values, it can be really, really hard to resolve because certain things just feel very instinctually comforting to ENFPs versus to other types. And those things really need to be addressed early on. So when you're looking for a partner, look at how do they spend their time, how do they spend their resources, and what feels very intuitively important to this person. So just being aware of those things early and being aware of how you like to spend your resource versus how someone else likes to spend theirs might save you a lot of heartache down the road and a lot of really, really difficult conversations and negotiations. Trait number seven that I really encourage us to look for in partners as ENFPs is someone who's not threatened by our social circle. So ENFPs um, can have this tendency to like zoom in on their partner and want to stay really, really focused on the relationship because it's so intense and you're getting so much connection out of it. But when we are at our healthiest, we are super social people with really big social circles and we need a lot of different relationships to give us different perspectives and keep us healthy and balanced and feeling like our full selves. And if we have a partner who feels very threatened, they're not comfortable with us having a large circle of friends, a large circle of acquaintances, um, constantly pursuing new relationships in different forms with obviously respectful boundaries in place, that's gonna be really difficult for us to mitigate because it's gonna be really, really challenging for us to feel like our full and entire selves without that very active social life. And our partner needs to be someone who, again, has enough autonomy and enough self-confidence and enough of their own stuff going on to feel really, really comfortable with us having a very active and engaged community. And ideally, our partner maybe even wants to be a part of that and wants to get to know our friends and get to know our family and can also introduce us to awesome new people in their lives. So that's not to say we need to be with a raging extrovert. I know a lot of ENFPs feel really comfortable around introverts, but we need to be with someone who feels very, very comfortable with and happy watching us shine in our own social circles. So in this video, we've talked a lot about what we need from other people, but I also wanna quickly address what we have to give and offer people. And that brings me to my last point, which is that we need a partner who is excited about growth. ENFPs are built to encourage, to cheerlead, to see the best in people and encourage them to work towards that best. And if we're in a relationship where someone doesn't want that, where maybe growth is very low on their own list of needs or interests, it's gonna be really hard for us to give what we are naturally born to give in a relationship, which is that encouragement, which is that exploration of different models and different frames of understanding and different perceptions. And if we can't offer that to someone and have them receive it, it's gonna feel like our gifts are being kind of wasted in that relationship. It's really important not to compromise on this one, not to tell yourself, I can take a partner who has a very fixed mindset and change them and push them to be different than they are. It's gonna work out best for you if you find a partner who's already very oriented towards growth and change and challenging themselves in new ways. You don't have to challenge each other. You need to find someone who likes to challenge themselves as much as you like to challenge yourself. And then the amount of growth you can do as a couple fusing that energy is incredible. And that's really something that I just wish for all ENFPs because it took me 27 years of my own life to find the first relationship that I really felt like I am encouraged to grow within. I see incredible growth opportunities for my partner that they're all so excited about. And we are two autonomous beings bringing out the best in each other. I didn't know that was an option. I really did think for the longest time in my life, relationships are just supposed to be really limiting and constraining and confining, and they don't have to be any of those things. So I think the number one piece of advice I would give for all ENFPs as extroverted, intuitive, dominant types who just wanna go out and explore and discover and find the best that they can in every situation is find someone with whom a relationship feels like it's opening more doors for you than it's closing, okay? A relationship should not be the thing that keeps you trapped or confined or keeps you from working on yourself. It should be something that opens more doors and offers more possibilities and gives you more roots and more perspectives through which you can explore the world both intellectually and physically. And don't worry about just hanging out and waiting for a really long time until that happens for you. Um, if we're not comfortable with ourselves, we're not ever gonna be comfortable with someone else. And first, we really have to figure out how to do all of the stuff I just talked about for ourselves outside of a relationship. But that's something 
we're gonna talk a lot more about because coming up, I'm gonna do a series on ENFPs and attachment styles. So I'm gonna cross-reference the ENFP type with every different attachment style and talk about what that might look like and which kind of flavors that gives each ENFP based on what their attachment style is. Um, if you don't know what attachment styles are, I have a bunch of videos on it, so you can find those on my channel. And last thing before we go, I just wanted to remind you guys, if you are an ENFP or if you know or love an ENFP, I run six week soul bootcamp programs. They're currently on the self study program on my website, which means you can go there and access the course at your own pace. You have six weeks worth of video content, but again, you can do it all on day one or you can do it over the course of a year, whatever works for you. We talk about lots of things from emotional intelligence to cognitive development to relationships for the ENFP. Um, but once again, you can go to my website at www.heidiprieb.com and find out much more about all of that there. I think that's it for today's video. I love you guys. I missed you. I'm going to see a lot more of you now that I'm all set up in my new place and we will talk again soon. I got no words.